Well, good morning again. We're going to start a new series uh, this morning called Not a Fan. And uh, it's based on this book by Kyle uh, Eidelman, who is a teaching pastor at Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky. And, uh, and it's an amazing book. Many of our staff have been reading it uh, over the last year or so. And they've been, uh, been, you know, prodding the pastors to say, we need to teach uh, this series uh, out of this book about what it means to be a completely committed follower of Jesus. We thought that it'd be a great way to start the year. How many of you want 2013 to be the best year of your life? I know I do, right? I mean, I, I want to be like good wine and good cheese, getting old, but older and better. And, uh, and so I want my next year to be the best year of my life. And so the teaching team, when we met uh, earlier this year, we said, we thought that this book and what we learned in it would be a powerful tool for us to begin the new year right. So that, as uh, Jen said, that we can constantly, you know, just consistently, daily be getting retooled and refilled uh, in, in, in our life together. So, take out your message notes. Uh, they look like this. On the left inside panel there, you'll see some fill in the blanks. And we invite you to fill them out and uh, make notes and those kinds of deals there. I hope that you'll follow along with us this morning. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you today that you're the God who loves us most and who loves us best, and that there's nothing that is beyond you. There's nothing too big for you. You know about everything in our life. And for some of us, God, uh, uh, that might be a scary proposition. But we thank you, God, that you're not just the God of truth. You're also the God of grace. And you know everything about us, but you're also loving. And your mercies are fresh and new. And you're just waiting for each of us uh, to turn to you. And I pray, God, that today uh, we will be refreshed and refueled for our journey. For we pray this in Jesus' name, everybody agreeing said, amen. amen. So by show of hands, a little test here early in the morning. How many of us this morning would say that you have a Twitter account? Raise your hand. Okay, just keep them on. There's maybe like 25 of us maybe. Okay. All right. How many of you don't even know what a Twitter account is? Raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, there's about 50 of you. Okay. So, uh, you know, we live in this amazing social network world, right? Uh, I was in uh, Nicaragua and in India uh, in the month of November and in December. And I was able to talk to my grandkids face to face because of social media. I, I, could, I could have a FaceTime message conversation with them. Um, we live in an amazing world where through Facebook we can post stuff about what's going on in our lives, videos, pictures, and we can share them with people who are in our Facebook friends uh, circle. And so we can do that. But Twitter is kind of the next generation. As a matter of fact, my really cool hip friends don't have Facebook anymore. They're Twitter people, you know. And, uh, and so let me explain uh, what Twitter is. This is a picture of my Twitter account on my laptop. And, uh, and I have a Twitter account, and I set it up. Uh, it's Pastor J. A. Savito. It's my Twitter account. And, and I have what are called uh, people that I am following. And these are people that I've signed up, and they have accepted me to follow them so that when they post something, I can see it. I can read it. And then I, I, there are people that are followers of me. They're following people I follow, followers, people who are following me. And, and when I type something in, they're in my kind of circle of trust, if you will, and they get my little tweet. That's what they call, uh, that's cool for 140 character message, tweets. And, and as a matter of fact, if you want to be really cool, say to your kids today, hey, hit me up with a tweet. And uh, they'll think you're just, they'll think you're old, is what they'll think you are. So, so yeah, so hit me up means send me a, a tweet. So it's 140 characters, so it's limited. Unlike Facebook, where it can be forever and ever. In a tweet, it's, it's limited. And you can just say cute little pithy things like, I went to McDonald's and had a hamburger. Or you can say sublime philosophical things like, I hate the traffic on 41. So you can, you know, you can say whatever you want. And... Uh, and so well, I was looking this week and I thought, who has the single largest Twitter account? And so I started to think, I started going, well, who would it be? And I thought, here, here were my top three. I thought number one uh, would be President Obama. Uh, he's in a, up, up near top ten, but he wasn't number one. And then I thought, it, it has to be Katy Perry. 
because, I mean, she's hot and all the guys like her. So, you know, might be her, but no, it wasn't Katie. And then I said, oh, I know, it's, it's the Bieber. It's Justin, right? Justin Bieber. And if, again, if you don't know who he is, then you're just old. I mean, <laughs> the Bieber man, he, Bieber mania, he is, he's just, uh, yeah, he's as hot as Katie. So, um, but it wasn't him. It wasn't him. The number one, uh, the number one Twitter account uh, in the world with 30, more than 32 million followers is Lady Gaga. Yeah. And she's just strange. As a matter of fact, you can't tell, but I had to black out stuff on her account. She's just strange. She's just, you know, she changes her hair. And, and Lady Gaga uh, has 32 um, million followers, more than that. And, and here's the question. Are, are they really, I mean, the language in Twitter world, are they really followers or are they just fans? I mean, you, you think about it. Uh, there's a huge difference between a follower and a fan. Followers know facts. They know facts. As a matter of fact, I went to uh, all things Lady Gaga, gagapedia.com, and I discovered some facts about Lady Gaga that I didn't know. She's five foot one. Her real hair color is brown, though she changes it regularly. She uh, has green eyes, and her favorite colors are black and lavender. And so uh, I know some things about her. And fans know lots of facts about those people that they admire. As a matter of fact, the definition, if you go to the dictionary, of the word fan means enthusiastic follower enthusiastic admirer. And so I could, I could go and get a Lady Gaga tattoo. I could buy a Lady Gaga t-shirt. I could download on my iTunes all the Lady Gaga music. But all I am is a fan. I'm not a follower. You see, we live in a world that confuses fans and followers. And that's what this series is about. It's about distinguishing the difference between what a fan is, an enthusiastic admirer, and what a follower is. Because let me just remind you that if you really follow somebody, it really makes a difference in your life. And who we follow, those numbers are very few. I remember when I was a little boy, when I was three and four and five, there are pictures in our family photo albums of me dressed just like my dad. My dad was a mechanic. And he worked on his cars. He didn't believe in taking a car to get the oil changed. You changed it yourself, right? And so I would, I would, I would get under the car with my little baseball cap on, and I, and I, Dad wore a cap, so I wore a cap. And he wore a little white wife beater, so I wore a little wife white beater, right? And and he had little smudges of grease on his face, so I had little smudges of grease on my face. At three, four, and five, all I wanted to do was be like my dad. I was a follower not just a fan. And yet, again, we confuse followers and fans. Followers, they want to be just like the one they're following. Followers, followers uh, allow the one that they're following to shape their hopes, their dreams, their aspirations, their, their, their values. When you follow somebody, you're radically transformed, you're radically changed by the one that you're following. But that doesn't happen when you're just a fan. Uh, yesterday uh, was all things holy for those of us that love the great state of Kentucky. Louisville played the University of Kentucky in basketball. And it wasn't pretty for those of us that are cat fans. We lost. But I'm just a fan. Frankly, I went to bed and didn't sleep ab think about it because I'm just a fan. I'm just a fan. I'm, I'm not a follower. I'm a fan. Now, here's the truth. Let's bring it to our life and our world together. Here's the truth. I, I think the hard truth is that many Christ followers are really Christ fans. Uh, we, we know a lot about Jesus. We know a lot of facts about Jesus. We know that he was born in, in Bethlehem to Joseph and Mary. We know that somewhere around 30 he began to preach and teach and heal. Around 33 he got abandoned and betrayed and denied that he died on the cross, that he rose from the dead, that 40 days later he ascended into heaven, 10 days later he, he sent the Holy Spirit. 
We, we've got the facts down. We've got the story down. We've got a 140-character tweeting relationship with Jesus. And we're just fans. We're not really followers. And, 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 and so my concern as your pastor is that what we do here um, 13 times a week at our four campuses when we gather for worship is that these gathering uh, can become a gathering of spectators, gathering of fans. It, it was, it was uh, Kierkegaard who said that worship really is, uh, is different than we perceive it. We think that these folks up here are the actors and that, that God's directing these folks up here and that, and that you guys are the spectators. But it was Kierkegaard who said the truth is, the truth is that the folks up here on the platform, all we are are directors, you are the actors, and God is the audience of one. But what my fear is, is that many of us can come to Grace Church week in and week out, and it's kind of like American Bandstand. For those of you who don't know what that is, Google it. You know, and we say, yeah, it was a great song, and it was easy to dance to. I give it an eight. And, and, and here's, here's what happens to us when we're kind of stuck in this fan routine is, is, is we come to church and we're here and, and we hear the music and, and, then, and then, we, then we get out in the car and here's, here's, I mean, this might hurt, but this is the truth. I mean, we get out in the car and then we begin the evaluation process. And we say, well, the band, I mean, they were hot, man. Uh, preaching, uh, George wasn't on his A game. And we start to evaluate things. And then the air conditioning, it was just too cold. The coffee wasn't that good today. And, and we kick into this evaluation, and, and I start to wonder, and, 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 and I, I'm worried that for many of us, we can come to Grace Church week in and week out, and that's what it is. We, we, we know when to stand, we know when to sit, we even know when to applaud. We got it down. But are we following Jesus? Are we really following Jesus? That's why for today and the next five weeks, we're going to talk about how we can make the movement from being a fan to being a follower. From being a fan, who knows facts, to really being a follower. Remember what the ancient rabbis said about those that followed their teacher. They wanted to follow so closely behind him that his dust would settle on them. That's the kind of radical transformation that God wants to make in our life. So the question we need to answer this morning is, how do I determine if I'm a fan or a follower of Jesus? I mean, how do is it that I can determine that? And I want you to be rigorously honest with yourself this morning because that's the only person you can be honest with is really yourself. And this morning, I want to use my little, uh, little uh, helper here to uh, help me in communicating this. I want you to answer four questions this morning. And here they are. The first question is this. Do I grade myself by comparison? So how many of you remember back in school when the teacher would, would say, hey, I'm going to give a test and today we're going to grade on a curve. You remember that? Those were really stinky days in class. Remember that? Grade on a curve. It meant that the really smart folks, you know, a few would get an A, a few more would get a B, majority would get a C, some would get a D, and a few of you would get E's, or I guess they changed it to F's later. Okay, that dates me. But, you know, and you really hated the people over here, didn't you? Yeah. I was one of these people over here. Okay, never mind. No. <laughs> Now it's closer to this side of the deal, truth be told. So, so grading on a curve, yeah. And here's what I've discovered when it comes to faith. When it comes to faith, we have a tendency to grade on a curve. And there are a few people in life that are doing really good in their walk with God. The Mother Teresas, the Billy Grahams. And most of us are smart enough to not compare ourselves to them. But what we have a tendency to do when it comes to faith is we have a tendency to measure ourselves against people who are doing worse than we are. And so we feel superior. And so we say things like this when it comes to our walk with Jesus. Well, at least I'm not fill in the blank. And you think of somebody you know or something that's happened, and we do this. We grade ourselves spiritually on a curve. 
Is that something that you do? Here's a second question we need to ask, a second little diagram I'm going to show you, is um, do I measure myself by performance? By performance. And here's the performance picture, okay? Think of it as a checklist, okay? It's a checklist. And on your checklist, you have things like, I go to worship every week. Check. And I'm in a small group. And so I do my small group thing. Check. I tithe. I give generously 10% to God. And then, and then I serve. Now, please hear me. If you've been at Grace Church any time, uh, you know that your pastors teach regularly the importance of worship, being in community, giving generously, and serving in, in the world and in our community. But here's the deal. We can begin to fool ourselves into believing that this means we have a relationship with Jesus that's intimate. This is, one of the, this is one of the downsides of being active in a church for quite a while, is we begin to grade ourselves by performance, and we begin to do these things not in response to God's amazing grace and mercy in our life, but we begin to do these kinds of things so that he will pour his mercy and grace into our lives. And that might be subtle, but it makes all the difference. So, when it comes to your walk with God, do you measure yourself by performance? Here's, here's the third one. Third question is, um, do I e evaluate myself by history? By history. And, and here's what I mean by that. Um, think of it as, this is church. This is my picture of church. And um, some of us grew up with a drug problem, as I've said before, because mama drug us to church. And <laughs> so we've been in church a while, right? And we've been here a while, and you got your own chair. Some of you never move. <laughs> really wigs me out on Christmas Eve. You know, I couldn't find you. <laughs> but, you know, we, we, we begin to evaluate ourselves, and we say, well, I, you know, I've been in church my entire life. Of course I have an intimate, of course I'm following Jesus. And what I want to remind you of is, and you know this, God doesn't, God doesn't have any grandchildren. He only has children. And, and we can begin to fool ourselves into thinking, you know, I'm walking with Jesus because mama walked with Jesus and because I've been in church. That's your heritage, your, your history. Fourth question, which is really the one we're going to focus on for the rest of the morning is, do I appraise myself, appraise myself with Jesus? And we chose the word with very carefully. So I want you to imagine with me that Jesus invites you to Starbucks. Wouldn't that be cool? And he invites you to Starbucks, and um, I don't know, what would Jesus drink at Starbucks? I, that's another sermon. But Jesus invites you to Starbucks, and you sit down at your little table, and Jesus sits at his chair, and uh, I told you I went to seminary. I didn't go to art school. And you sit across from Jesus, and so this is Jesus, and this is me. Okay? Me. All right, so you and Jesus sit down, and you are going to appraise. You know, you, you know when you get an appraisal, they come in and they do, they do a deep dive on your property. You know, they, they check the pipes, the electrical stuff. They climb up in the roof. They check the, the, they check the, 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 the insulation. They check everything. And you and Jesus sit down, and you have what's called a DTR meeting. A DTR meeting. You say, well, what's that? Watch this real short video. It'll tell you what a DTR video is, what a meeting is. Watch this. DTR. Some of you will recognize what those letters stand for. If you're not sure, let me help you out. If you are a young man in a relationship with a young woman, then uh, chances are these letters are enough to strike fear into your heart. You may run away from, postpone, you may dread the DTR talk. Some young men will even terminate a relationship if they feel like the DTR talk is imminent. It is that official talk that takes place in every romantic relationship. Do you know what it stands for, DTR? Define the relationship. You sit down and you decide where things are going. Have things moved from casual to committed? I 
remember this um, date I went on in high school. On the very first date, the girl tried to have the DTR talk with me. First date, DTR. I got out of their PDQ. I just ran away. PDQ stands for pretty darn quick. So you and Jesus sit down for a DTR talk. Define the relationship. And Jesus asks you, are you a fan or are you a follower of me? You, you and Jesus sit down, and, 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 and he wants to know. He sits across the table for you, from you. And he's going to do a deep dive, an appraisal with you of your relationship with him. What might he ask us? Teaching team thought that there would be three essential DTR questions Jesus could ask me. That if I sat across the table from Jesus, he'd say, George, these three things I want to know from you this morning. So here they are. Number one, why are you here? Uh, why are you here? You know, when you read the Bible, and specifically those four biographies of Jesus, when you read the Bible, Jesus often had these, what I would call, uh, line-in-the-sand meetings with people. You, you remember one time a rich young ruler came to him, and, and Jesus, he said, I, I want to I have eternal life. And Jesus said, there's a problem. You love money and the things that money buy, so go give it all to the poor, then come and follow me. And the guy walked away. And Jesus didn't, remember, Jesus didn't kick into a bargaining with the guy. Jesus didn't say, okay, 50%. Just give away 50%. And Jesus drew a line in the sand, and he said, you know, you're, you're, you're either going to follow me or you're not going to follow me. And one of those times is in John's biography. And Jesus, I mean, his popularity ratings were off the charts. I mean, if, if there were popularity ratings in those days, Jesus was at the top of the charts. And people were coming to Jesus because he was teaching radical things. He was preaching an amazing message, and he was healing people performing all kinds of miracles. And in John chapter 6, there's a large crowd that's gathered. They're many, many uh, miles away from a place where they could get food. And Jesus takes five loaves of bread and a handful of fish, and he feeds thousands of men and women. And when we get to John chapter 6, Jesus says this in verse 2. He said, and they were following him. They were following him because of the miracles. They were following Jesus because he was giving them a show. He was giving them bread. They were hungry, and they wanted to come to the show. They wanted to see the performance. They weren't after Jesus or even his teachings. They were after the spectacle. Now, stay with me on this one. It begs the question that if Jesus were to have a define the relationship conversation with you or me, he might say to me, George, why are you here? I mean, here. I mean, in this room right now, 1042. Why are you here? Jesus might ask me, what is your because? Why are you here because of what? Why are you here? Comfy seats, music's got a good beat, cheap breakfast, here for the kids? No, not bad reasons to begin with. I get it. Remember, I'm not talking about uh, having a define the relationship conversation if you're just figuring out this whole God stuff. I'm talking about if you've been walking with Jesus for a while, if you've been coming for a while, Jesus might say to you, hey, Fred, Cindy, Sue, why are you here? Now, again, this is in this story that we're looking at in John chapter 6, Jesus is drawing a line in the sand, and he challenges them on their coming just to get a piece of bread. And of course, you know what their response was, right? I mean, everybody, yay, we'll follow Jesus, right? It's interesting. It's one of the saddest verses in all of the Bible, John 6, 66. John 6, 66. It's on the screen. Read this with me. Ready? Go. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer, they no longer what? They no longer followed him. They, they were okay with Jesus when, he, when they, they thought he was just somebody, a fan, somebody they could get a tattoo and download his album. 
But when Jesus said, if you want to follow me, it's going to cost you something. John 6, 66. They turned their backs on Jesus and they no longer followed him. I've been here a long, long, long time. And I've seen thousands of people come through these services. And sometimes they, you know, they, they get mad at me or they get mad at something we do and, and they leave. And I wonder, are you following Jesus or are you following George? Because I'm going to let you down. If I haven't, just wait around a bit. <laughs> but it's not about following me. It's about following Jesus. And I think there's some of us that we really need to hear Jesus say, what, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? You see, Jesus, hear me, he wants an intimate relationship with you. Which would lead me to the second question I think that Jesus might ask me, is he might ask me, number two, are you all in? Are you all in? We don't like, uh, we, let's just be honest, none of us, None of us like complete surrender. N none of us like all in. But this following Jesus is a whatever it takes kind of relationship. L let me just remind you, uh, uh, 31 years ago, a few weeks back, I stood at the altar of our church and I said, I do to Cheryl. And these 31 years later, I can tell you it's, it's better. And here's the deal. I will do whatever it takes to be all in with her. All in. There's nothing except following Jesus that's more important to your pastor than his marriage. And let me just tell you, if I have to choose between the marriage and my ministry, it's not even close. And I love doing what I do. But remember, it's I'll do whatever it takes to keep Cheryl here on earth, number one in my life, not my kids, and this one's hard for me to say, not my grandkids, <laughs> get in front of her. So here's the kind of stuff Jesus would say to us. Luke 9, 23 says, if anyone would come after me, he or she must deny himself or herself, take up his or her cross daily, and what? Follow me. This is pretty tough stuff. We don't like absolute commitment. We like exit clauses. We prefer selective commitment. We like customized Christianity. You know, when Jesus says to me, hey, George, you know that resentment you have against that person? Everything inside of me goes, oh, I like keeping this bitterness, this resentment. I can't give this to you, Jesus. You must deny yourself and follow me, Jesus says. Whenever I get in a tussle with, with money and, and love of money, and I'm just as guilty as anybody, and Jesus says, are you, are you going to put, is that going to be on the table? Will money be something you'll keep off the table, or will it get right up here? And will you and I have a determined, uh, a define the relationship conversation about money? Or your sexuality, George. Are you willing to lay your sexuality right up there on the table so that you and me can talk about what you think about? What happens when you're alone? in front of the computer screen. Is that up for conversation? Are you all in, George, or are you just part of the way in? And I'm just like you, but I like selective. I like Chinese Christianity, Chinese menu Christianity. I like picking one from column A and one from column B. But Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, then you've got to deny yourself. You've got to die on the cross every day, and you have to follow me. I have to determine everything in your life. Everything on the table. Number three. Number three is, have you made it your own? Have you made it your own? You know, when I first started dating Cheryl, uh, she listened to music that I didn't like. She liked bread. If a picture paints a thousand words, then why can't I paint you? Oh, it made me want to throw up. <laughs> I was an Aerosmith kid. I mean, I like rock and And she wanted to listen to bread. And guess what? I started dating Cheryl, and all of a sudden, I liked bread. <laughs> I 
And then we got married. And then I didn't like bread anymore. (laughs) Here's the deal. I was willing to like it because I wanted her to like me. And here's what happens. You know, about 80% of the people who come to Grace Church came because somebody else invited them. So somebody invites you here, and you, you like the music, and you think Wes and I are okay, and, and you, you, you know, you're here, and you come, and, and, and you know, you're, you're okay with this Jesus stuff, and, and, and you're here, and you're challenged, and you might even get involved. In, but, but the question begs to be asked, have you really made this relationship with Jesus your own? Or are you just kind of going through the motions? And, and remember the story about the guy with the drug problem? He got drugged to church by mama. When you get drugged to church by mama, you can begin to think that mama's faith is your faith. And, and yet Jesus challenged us on that. I mean, these are words. I mean, there are hard statements of Jesus, and this is one of them. Uh, look with me at Luke 14, uh, verse 26. Read this with me. Ready? Go. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple, my follower. Now, now stay with me. Jesus isn't saying it's okay to hate mommy and daddy, wife, kids, brothers, sisters, okay? What Jesus is using is he's using exaggeration to prove a point. And his exaggeration that he's proving is he's saying, look, if you're going to have a relationship with me, it's not about mom, dad, wife, kids, brothers, sisters. It's about you and me. That's what it's about. It's about you and me. So today, we begin what's going to be now a six-week journey in this series, Not a Fan. And we're going to talk about what it means to be a completely committed follower, not a fan. And here's what I want you to do. Here's your assignment for this week. I want to invite you this week to have one of these with Jesus. Most of you won't be at work. All the students aren't in school until next week. So you can find one hour to get away and to be quiet in a corner, in the woods, down by the lake, wherever it takes to have a DTR talk with Jesus. And I want you to ask Jesus one question and say, Jesus, am I I a fan or am I a follower? Am I a fan or am I a follower? Do I have a 140 character tweeting relationship with you? Or do we have a deep, intimate, all in, everything on the table, faith is my own, relationship with you. Now, let me say this before we close. It's not like Jesus wants to penalize you. Do you remember what Pastor West's favorite Bible verse is? It's John 10, 10, B. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and that it might be life that overflows. Jesus wants you to be a follower of his because he wants your life to overflow. He wants your life to matter. Jesus wants your 2013 to be the best year of your life. And let me just say unequivocally, it'll happen if you become a completely committed follower of Jesus. All in. Let's stand for prayer. Well, Lord, this is not one of those easy uh, type messages. The series isn't one of those easy type messages. And there might be some of us that are tempted to say, well, I'm going to check out for the next five weeks. But Lord, I pray that uh, we would know who it is that's whispering in our ear that devilish message. Lord, thank you that you want us to move from being fans to being followers, not because you're penalizing us, but because you want us to live life fully in you. You want our lives to be a great adventure. And so many of us, truth be told, we live a kind of boring, haphazardless life. It just doesn't matter. And Lord, you invite us into this amazing relationship with you. 
You want all in because when we're all in with you, we live life at its best. And so I pray, Lord Jesus, that right here at the end of 2012, as we look forward to 2013, we will say to you, Jesus, fan no longer follower from here on out. And that you'll have a whole bunch of DTR talks with us, like you've had with me over the years. And you'll invite us to put stuff up on the table and we'll fight about it and you'll win because you're God and we're not. And it'll be for our good. So Lord, have your way as we sing these love songs to you. Have your way in us, we pray. In Jesus' name and everybody agreeing said. Amen. The altar's gonna be open and if you wanna come and pray, you're invited to do that. I'm gonna ask uh, Greg to be over here at the cross and if you've never said yes to Jesus, uh, then you can do that this morning. And we'd love to pray with you. Greg would love to pray with you, give you a gift. And, uh, and so the altar's open. If you've got any need in your life, you want somebody to pray with you. Our team's here. They would just love to pray with you. They're wonderful folks. Altars open as we sing these love songs. Team, lead us.